Yeah, okay, there we go. Wow. <laughs> All right, good evening. Good to see everybody here. We're going to take a few minutes and talk about our prayer request, and then we'll uh, go into a time. I want to kind of give you my testimony tonight and also give you a chance to ask, ask some questions. So maybe I, that's why we're going to pray at the beginning before you ask the questions, okay? <laughs> and then we'll pray again at the end, I'm sure. Uh, is there anything we need to be updated on as far as the, the prayer list goes? I can tell you that Cleo Hutchins was actually moved to Forsyth. And I, has she come back to a bright? They are trying to get her back to Brighton Star. Okay. They, they said they wanted her to get rehab. Mm-hmm. But that's what she gets when she's in Brighton Star. So they're trying to work that out so they will leave her from the hospital. Okay. All right, so she is at Forsyth right now. I went to Brighton Gardens to see her the other day, and they sent me to Forsyth. And, um, but anyway, she's at Forsyth right now. Hopefully, she'll get to go back to Brighton here soon. Is there anyone else you'd like to update us on tonight? Any changes? Yes, ma'am. Got it. Okay, so Barbara French, okay, all right, anything else? Okay, um, I'm not going to repeat that just since we're, on, since we're online, but a family that... that uh, that you work with that's really struggling right now. Are they part of a church? Oh, no, they, they're, yeah, they're okay, so they've got support. And okay, all right. Anything else? Good. You want to keep him on the list for a while, though? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. Got a long way to go. Okay. Okay. So that's Ross Vestal. He's doing well, but still, still needs our prayers. Good. Anything else? And she's having surgery tomorrow? Okay, so Janet Davis will be having surgery tomorrow. Had a little accident with her finger, so be in prayer for her. Mary Stillman? Okay, Mary Stillman's in the hospital. I about fell off that chair. <laughs> Go to the back. Okay, all right. Now, uh, Good, good. Now, what about the mom? Is she the mom's doing well? Doing well, she's tired. But doing well. <clears throat> good, good. All right. Anything else before we pray together, Jeff? Okay, you said Clyde? Yeah, I just realized something. Am I supposed to be telling uh, our secretary who to put on the list? That's good to know. (laughs) So (laughs) I'll probably need to uh, get some more names of the names we just took because I didn't write them all down. Um, But next week, next week I'll remember that. So Clyde, we'll make sure to put Clyde on the the prayer list. Judy. Good. But he's, do, he's doing better now, though. Good. All right. Last call. Amanda Dad William. She had surgery last week. Um, the, her baby in utero had spina bifida, and they did surgery to try to help correct that. And she's got to, they're trying to keep the baby uh, not delivered until Thursday. Okay. 
Okay. And you said Amanda Williams? Okay. All right. She is. What week did you say she was now? Okay, so they're just trying to hold off, uh, hold off having the baby till she's 38 weeks, 37. 37 weeks. Okay, all right. Well, let's take a moment and uh, we'll pray together and ask the Lord to speak to us tonight. And then uh, I almost said we'll go into our time of business. It might be a time of business once I finish. Who knows? <laughs> so <laughs> let's move in uh, to our time together tonight. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your love towards us, Lord. That that love doesn't end. And that it doesn't wear out. Lord, thank you for your patience. Lord, it's amazing just how much you put up with from us. And we thank you for it. Lord, with all the things that we've been asked to pray for tonight, Lord, we can't even remember them all. Lord, much less really do anything about it. But Father, we thank you that as we come to you, we're coming to one who will not forget one thing that's been said. And Lord, one who can actually help in every situation. One who can actually change every situation. Lord, thank you for the uh, answered prayers that were reported tonight. We appreciate all that you've already done. And Lord, in each of these situations, Father, we can honestly now say we thank you for the things that you're going to do because we know you're, you're going to take care of everything. We love you, and Lord, we ask you that you'd speak to us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to start tonight by just giving you... Uh, my testimony, kind of a short testimony. I'm only 35, so it can be a fairly short uh, testimony. Uh, every, every believer, every person who knows Christ has a testimony. Now, your testimony might not be dramatic. And actually, I tell you, if your testimony is not a dramatic testimony, that's a grace of God. <laughs> that's a good thing. Everybody's testimony is not the same. Everybody's testimony is not dramatic. But if you've come to know Christ, you, you have a testimony. And one of the greatest weapons you have when it comes to evangelism, to telling other people about Jesus, is just being able to say, this is what he did for me. This is how he changed me, and this is how he's continuing to change my life. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about my life growing up, and up to this point, how God's worked in my life, uh, just the grace of God. Let me read one verse to you. This is one of my favorite verses uh, in Scripture. It's actually two verses. Philippians chapter 1, I'm going to read verse 12 and 13. Now Paul is in prison when he's writing this. He's chained to a Roman guard. And he said this, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Paul says, I want you to know as I'm sitting here chained to this man, I can't go do what I want to do. I want you to know that these chains have actually been used by God to carry the gospel places I never could have gone. He was chained to an imperial, one of the imperial guard. The imperial guard were the ones who guarded the, the household of Caesar. Paul could have never gone into the palace, but there was this guard that was chained to him day in and day out that heard him talk about the gospel, heard him talk about Jesus day in and day out. Eventually, some of these guards start to believe, and these guards go and take the gospel into the palace. At the end of the book of Philippians, uh, the, uh, Paul, as he's closing, he actually says, uh, the believers in Caesar's household greet you. Uh, the gospel went into Caesar's household because Paul was chained to some man he didn't want to be chained to. Uh, every aspect of your story, the negative parts, the positive parts, every aspect of your story is actually for God's glory. Uh, I'll talk about myself. I was born at a very early age, and I just want to see if anybody would get that. <laughs> I've always wanted to say it. I was born at a very early age, and I didn't know my mother very well. I've heard that said, so I always wanted to try it. Um, I was born to a great family. My mom and dad both knew the Lord, both loved the Lord. We went to church, we went to church, you know, we didn't just go three times a week, we went, sometimes it was every night of the week. Uh, my family, we sang at revivals and did things like that, so we were, we were always in church. I actually trusted Christ when I was five years old, somewhere between five and seven, I don't exactly remember when, and, and I'll tell you in a minute why I don't exactly remember when. Uh, somewhere between five and seven, though, I just, I came to realize I was a sinner and I needed a savior, and I trusted Christ. Uh, but after that, there was a long period of my childhood and even my teenage years where I really struggled over whether I was really a Christian or not. I mean, it was a, it was a difficult struggle. Now, I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I'm going somewhere with some of the things I'm going to say tonight, so just stick with me. Uh, as a child, I'm talking about five, six years old, I struggled terribly with anxiety. And uh, that anxiety played out a lot in my 
in my faith, I, just that constant worry, am I really a child of God, am I not a child of God, if Jesus came back right now, you know, I'd have nightmares, if Jesus came back right now, what's going to happen to me, and so it really, it really, um, I, I wouldn't say it did damage, but it was really difficult when I was a kid, uh, and a lot, of the, a lot of the preachers that we were around, they were good men, I believe they, they knew the Lord and loved the Lord, but they didn't always understand that they could do damage to people uh, when they were playing on emotions. I would hear things like, well, if you're not sure you're saved, you better run down here and make sure you're saved right now. Well, that sounds good and all, but there's people sitting out there that are emotionally unstable, and it just does damage to people like that. So there's a lot of anxiety as a child. Am I saved or am I not saved? I know I came to Christ when I was five. I really, really struggled with that. But at the same time, I started preaching in, in church when I was about seven years old. So while everybody else was out playing basketball, you know, I had the potato box pulled out of the kitchen. I was behind the potato box letting them have it. You know, now I'm sure, I'm sure 90% of what I've said wasn't true, but that didn't bother me. <laughs> I was still going to keep preaching. I started preaching when I was seven. When I was around 15, the Lord really started opening doors and I started traveling. Not, not a lot, but started traveling some preaching. And, and my prayer was just, Lord, if you want me to do this with my life, if you want me to preach, then God, you open the doors. And the doors just kept opening. I, you know, was preaching revivals and youth conferences and things like that. People ask me sometimes, how did you know you were called to ministry? I honestly never knew a time I wasn't. I just, from a kid, that's, that's what God had put in my heart. So I started preaching, started, started traveling some preaching. The Lord opened a lot of doors. Uh, but even during my teenage years, I had this real struggle. I remember it was around my junior or senior year of high school. I really came up against it because I really started questioning and wondering. And then my anxiety started playing into it. I started wondering, you know, is God really real? And how do I know he's real? So I did all kinds of research and all kinds of study. And I remember there were days I was at work and I just felt like I was being tormented. Like literally tormented. That's the only way I could describe it. And I wanted so bad to believe God was real. And I wanted so bad to believe that Jesus really was his son. But, but I just could not convince my own mind. So I started doing a lot of research, and there's a lot of things I found. One of the things that really, really um, captured my heart was DNA. Now, I would say the whole thing for, you know, the whole DNA, but I'm not going to say it because it's just too long and I can't remember it. Uh, DNA, as I started researching DNA, there is no way, no absolute way possible that DNA came about by accident. One strand of DNA I believe, if I remember my facts correct, one strand of DNA holds more information in it than all the volumes of books ever written. <laughs> that didn't happen by accident. So yeah, I became convinced, okay, there has to be a God, there has to be a creator, but then how do we know it's, how do we know it's Jehovah? How do we know it's, it's the Old Testament God? And then there was that struggle. And then, and then I even went so far as, okay, well, how do we know anything we're told is true, right? How do we know George Washington ever lived? How do we know that's not a big scandal? And my mind was just going haywire. And I remember I was sitting in a service one day, and the most simple thing happened. I was sitting there. The Lord hasn't spoke to me a lot of times in my life, but the Lord spoke to me in that service. And it was so simple. He said, you've just got to trust me. And I remember sitting there, and I said, Lord, I, there's a lot of things I don't understand. I feel like I'm going crazy. But, Lord, I'll just trust you. I'm just going to believe. And, and I can't explain it, but at that moment, peace when I finally just surrendered to faith and I said, Lord, I'll trust you regardless of my doubts, regardless of my struggles. I'm going to put my faith in you. I'm going to put all my eggs in that basket. At the moment that I said that peace came and then all the things that I'd been studying, it all started falling into place and it all started making sense. And I learned then, right then, there really is no way to approach God except for through faith. Uh, if, any, if anyone wants to approach God, he's got to come by faith, believing that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And that day as I just, again, placed my faith in him, then all the things I'd studied started to make sense, and everything started to come together, uh, and I, I, I just became very settled in not just that there was a God, but that Jesus Christ really is the historical Son of God. I mean, it really happened. After that, I left and I went to uh, Bible college, and when I got to Bible college, a strange thing happened. I started reading the Bible, and it wrecked my world. <laughs> I had always read the Bible. But I had read the Bible through the lenses that I had been given. You know, you're told this is what it says, this is what it means, and don't question. <laughs> well, I started reading the Bible, and I found there was a whole lot of things in the Bible that I was told wasn't there. And then I found there was a whole lot of things I was told wasn't in the Bible that actually were there. 
And it actually, it didn't send me into a tailspin. It just kind of began to, to redirect me in, in my direction of life. Uh, my senior year of college, and my wife already knows this, so y'all don't have to be shocked in what I'm about to tell you. Uh, my senior year of college, I got engaged, and it was not to my wife. <laughs> um, we got engaged, and then I hit one of the most severe depressions I've ever experienced in my life. I remember waking up sometime uh, in college. I remember waking up, and it felt like I was being eat at from the inside out. That's the only way I know. I mean, literally, it felt like something was just gnawing on me. The depression was... It was so awful. The anxiety was so bad. Because of that, the engagement actually ended up breaking up. And now I can honestly say I'm glad it did. Um, We wouldn't have been good together. It would have been a mess. If we had have got married, the Lord knew what he was doing. But at that time, it was like literally everything, just senior year of college. uh, I could have, she was from Canada, so I could go to Canada. I've got opportunities there to go and pastor, start a church right out of college. And everything just crumbled. I mean, it just crumbled. Came home, um, got on the right medication, and it made a world of difference. Uh, After that, I slowly started to, and I love, I love, and I have so much respect for the people that I I grew up around. Um, But I had a conversation with a pastor one day, and he said to me, he said, you know, you look at us, and you think we preach Jesus too much, but have you ever thought that maybe we, or you look at us, and you think that we don't preach Jesus enough, but have you ever thought that we look at you and maybe think you preach Jesus too much? When he said that, I knew it was time for me to move on. I knew that I, I, I was going a different direction than, than they were. And again, good people, people I believe that love the Lord, we just weren't going the same direction anymore. At that point, I went to Salem Baptist Church in Dobson. I became a member there, started, I was traveling a lot, doing evangelism then, and um, Holy Spirit's calling somebody. <laughs> um, doing a lot of Sunday morning fill-ins and, and preaching and stuff. Went to Salem, uh, the Lord opened doors there. After Salem, I was called to Rockford, you know, on the other side of East Bend. And I love the people at Rockford, great people, but I didn't understand, I just didn't understand why God was calling me there to pastor. Because Salem was a large church, television ministry, I mean, a lot going on. And the pastor there had really just shown me a lot of favor. So he was using me a lot as a young guy. And then he resigned. So then I was filling in for him, you know, a lot, uh, like after he resigned. It just, and then I got called to Rockford, and it just did not make any sense. But I said, Lord, if you want me there, I'll go. But I've got to know you want me there. So if you want me there, you're going to have to give me at least 99% of the vote. Because I knew that wouldn't happen. Well, they voted that day, and I got 101% because some lady asked to join so she could vote for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay. I wasn't there very long, and uh, I believe when you go to a church, unless the Lord tells you difference, when you go to a church, you go there to stay. You don't go there to be there a year or two and then move on. Now, I'll tell you, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I will be here till God says that he's done with me here. Hopefully not a day longer, and hopefully not a day less. I hope that's a long time. But I believe when you go to a church, you ought to go with the mentality, I'm going to plant my life there. Uh, when I went to Rockford, I went with that mentality, but it wasn't long after I got there, the Lord really started working in my heart, and, and it was again. I, I'm not saying that I heard a voice, but I just knew God told me, you will only be here for 18 months. Well, we had a, I had a couple in the church that came up to me one Sunday, and they, and they were just talking casually, and they said, look, we know you're only going to be here 18 months. <laughs> And I said, what? (laughs) They said, yeah, you won't be here long. You're only going to be here about 18 months. It was 18 months almost to the day that Crestwood Baptist Church called me to be their pastor. The first time, no, I was working at hospice and I was pastoring. And y'all know there there, there is a part-time paid, a pastor who gets paid part-time. There's no such thing as a part-time pastor. So I was working at hospice. I was uh, covering 17 counties plus pastoring plus doing revivals and stuff. I was working some weeks 80, 90 hours between the two. And I don't care how old you are. You know, people say, well, you're young. You can do it. No, no we're not made for that kind, of, that kind of hours. So I was praying, Lord, you've got to open a door. Something's got to give. Crestwood called me as their pastor. The first time I met with the search team, there was this girl sitting on the search team. She was sitting across from me, and I thought she was married. She had a ring on, so I wouldn't even look her in the eye, right? And uh, then I found out that that girl was not married. She was actually the daughter of our worship leader. Our worship leader, a lot of you already know, Melody Vaughn. She's on Joy FM. Uh, she was the worship leader at Crestwood at that point. Well, and I thought to myself, I said, well, I can't go, to, you know, Shepherd can't go dating the sheep. That ain't right. Then I thought, well, maybe in a year. And then I thought, well, maybe in six months. 
And three months after I'd been at Crestwood, me and Lindsay were dating. And uh, we went on our first date. And, you know, the church never pushed it, but the church never had a problem with it either. Everybody at the church already had our wedding planned, but they didn't make it, you know, they didn't make it happen. Uh, so we, we, we started dating. Uh, we got married sometime after that. She'll tell you how long it was. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we got married. Uh, and I have, I love my wife. She's the right one for me. No doubt about that. I love my in-laws. I got a great family. And then we had... Uh, had Benson, and y'all know how much I love Benson. Now, now let me tell y'all something. I love my son. I think the world of my son, and I'm going to talk about him all the time, but I'm not naive as to think he's not a sinner. He is already proving that he is, and he's going to be a good one, okay? So don't think when I talk about him that I think that he's not a sinner. He is, and he is, he's going to be a professional, I have a feeling. He gets out, he ta- Shh, no, don't listen to this. I tell people that he looks like his mama, but he acts like his daddy because he wants to go to heaven. But don't tell Lindsay that I said that. <laughs> so um, anyway, we had Benson, uh, it was about a year ago, April. No, no, I'm, I'm going back to Crestwood. Yeah, Benson's two years old now. Uh, and he, he showed up. Y'all, Duke lost. Was it Saturday night? Coach K's final game. Duke lost. <laughs> I'm going to bring that up. But Duke lost. And Benson got so upset about it, he showed up three weeks early. It was, uh, what, two or three o'clock Sunday morning. We woke up, and he was on his way. <laughs> and he was here by 1130 that day. So anyway, the last year, I was at Crestwood for seven years, almost seven years. I started there Easter Sunday, so almost the same as here. I love the people. We got along so great. The Lord worked there. But last Easter, I stood up, and I looked around, and it just hit me very definitely, you're done. And, and so then I went through, and Lindsay can tell you, I went through a period of back and forth. Is this, is this just discouragement? Is this the Lord? Is it, you know, and over a several month period, I just really came to understand, okay, I, my ministry has plateaued here. I'm plateauing here. I'm not being stretched anymore. It's time for a new phase of ministry at this church. It's time for a new phase of ministry uh, for me. And um, so we just said, Lord, we'll, we open ourselves up. And then, of course, long story short, uh, Judy called me and got talking with the search team I prayed the, the day that um, y'all voted on me. Lord, I don't want to go if you don't want me there. So if you want me there, I have to have an a overwhelming vote of confidence to prove that this is, that this is your will. And I'm not going to tell you who it is. It don't matter. But uh, I think that day we got like 97.5%. And somebody even told me uh, later that they come with every intention of voting against me. <laughs> but they decided to vote for me. So that was one of those things I was like, okay, Lord, you must, you must uh, have been in this. And so here we are. That is the short story. Uh, depression, anxiety. Uh, some would look at it and say, oh, you poor thing. But I, I do not look at it that way. The way I look at depression and anxiety, and I, I, one day I'll preach on it. I'll bring a message here on it one day. I've got a message I entitled My Ugly Friend about depression and anxiety. But I look at it the way that Paul looked at his chain. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. If it hadn't been for depression and anxiety as a young kid, I probably wouldn't have the interest in God and Christ and spiritual things that I had. If it wasn't for depression and anxiety as a teenager, I would not have really dug in to study and find out if this thing is real, if this thing is true. If it wasn't for depression and anxiety, I would have married a girl, and I'd been up in Canada today, where do y'all know they have black squirrels? In Canada, they have black squirrels, and I knew when I saw that, this just ain't right. It snows. It snows from April, uh, or it snows up there from about September to April. You can't grow a rose in that short a period of time, so I'm glad God did what he did there. Uh, in all those things, the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And so I can actually say now, though I don't like it, <laughs> I can actually say now that I'm thankful that God has allowed me to experience some of those things. I, I hope that it's made me a kinder pastor. I hope that it's given me more sympathy for people. I know that it has been used of God to keep me humble, and I, I, I'm glad for that, and I appreciate that. So, so that, that is the short of my testimony. Now, real quick, and then we're going to go into questions, because I said you could ask questions tonight. Um, 
And don't ask me about anything from, about the girl from Canada, okay? We're not talking about that. That's in the past. <laughs> um, let me tell you real quick kind of what my philosophy is as your pastor, how, how I'm going to pastor you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul said of the church, he says, we are God's fellow workers, so pastors, we are God's fellow workers, and he says, you are God's field. So the church is God's garden. Now, I know we've got some farmers in this church, okay? You know way more about plants and everything than I do, but I, I do love to garden. I enjoy gardening. I came across that one day, and I realized that if, if, if I'm God's fellow laborer and the church is his garden, then so much of what I do in the garden is what I'm going to need to do in the church. So my, my pastoral philosophy is built around the garden, basically. There are several things I do in the garden that I'm going to do in the church. The first is I'm going to plow. I'm going to prepare the soil. Uh, that's done a lot of different ways, but the fallow ground, the hard ground has to be broken up. Uh, the weeds have to be plowed out. And that's so much of what we do in preaching. We're just plowing the ground. We're just softening up the ground because our hearts, even believers' hearts, get so hard against God. So, so much of preaching is just plowing the ground and softening it, softening it up. So much of my visiting, I, I like to visit the people in the church. So much of my visiting is just trying to get close enough uh, to them so that when I have to cut close to their row one day, <laughs> that they'll know that I love them. They'll know that, that, uh, that what I'm doing, I'm doing out of care. So, so the first thing the pastor has to do, he has to plow the ground, he has to prepare the soil. Uh, then the next thing I have to do as a pastor is I have to plant seed. Not just any seed, but good seed. The only good seed is the gospel, the word of God. So uh, private conversations, public preaching, I'm always going to be pointing you back to the gospel and, and planting that seed in the heart. And the thing is, with seed, the more seed you throw out, the better chance you're going to have of a harvest, right? The more harvest you're going to have. So I want to throw out as much seed as possible, as often as possible. Uh, then I'm going to provide for the plants. Germination is something I cannot make happen. I cannot make that dead plant, that dead seed come to life, germinate and pop up through the soil. I cannot make a dead soul come to life. But when God does that, my job as a pastor is to care for that little seedling. My job as a pastor is to water it. And that's done through, again, through the preaching and the teaching of the word, through discipleship, through prayer. I'm to water it. I'm to fertilize it. You know, encourage it. Uh, the pastor's primary job is to is to prepare to, to uh, enable the saints, equip the saints for the work of the ministry. But another thing I have to do is I have to protect the garden. I have two little uh, beagles. And when my dad first got sick, he asked if they could come stay at our house for a couple of days. And they've been here how many years now? Three? Three years. <laughs> so uh, I found out real quick when they came to live with us, if I didn't put up a fence around that garden, there was going to be no garden. Um, I have to do a lot just protecting the garden from them. And I'm going to tell you something. There will be times when you might not understand what I'm doing, but it might very well be that I see something coming that you don't see coming, and what I'm trying to do is just protect the garden. I might put up a fence, and you think, well, that fence don't belong there. We ain't never had a fence there. Well, again, the shepherd can see a wolf coming and sometimes hear a wolf coming where maybe the sheep don't. So one of my jobs, I'm, I'm to care for God's flock, God's garden. And so when God leads and when God directs, sometimes we're going to have to put up new fences around the garden. Another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to prune the plants. Now, it's not my job to prune you. That's job, God's job. Okay? But it is going to be sometimes my job to prune the church. When I grow my tomatoes every year, the one thing I hate to do, but I've got to do it, I've got to sucker this, those things. Those little suckers come up and they suck out. They're called suckers for a reason. They suck all the energy out of the plant and the plant gets big, the plant gets bushy, but there's no tomatoes. The church is the same way. The church can get really big, really bushy, and have no fruit. We can get so busy doing so many things and not actually bearing any fruit if we're not careful. So sometimes we have to come along, we have to look at the plant, we have to sucker the plant, we have to say, okay, what's actually bearing fruit? What ministry in the church is actually bearing fruit that we need to put more energy into? And what ministries in the church are actually just sucking energy out of us? So sometimes that's not always popular, but sometimes that has to be done, but it's so the plant can bear fruit, which is what the plant is for, which is its purpose. And the last thing, and I'm, I'm just skimming over all of these, but the last thing I get to do as a pastor, and this is the part I get to do, is sometimes I get to pick, I get to be part of the harvest. 
Sow seed, water seed, fertilize seed. It's a wonderful thing as a pastor when every once in a while you get to be part of the harvest and you get to see people change and you get to see people grow. You get to see people move forward, come to Christ. And then not only them come to Christ, but one day you get to marry them. And then after you marry them, then you get to dedicate their kids one day. Then you get to baptize their kids one day and and, and get to see how that, get to see that fruit. That's one of the best parts of the ministry. I love planting, but I love it when the fruit starts coming in. And that's one of the best parts about pastoring is sometimes God lets me be part of the harvest and lets me go along down the rows and pluck a little fruit. So that's kind of my philosophy of pastoring. I approach pastoring like I approach gardening. And uh, my wife will tell you, if I'm not here at church, I'm out in my garden. (laughs) So uh, I can say I'm always gardening one way or the other. Um, But that's kind of the way I I am going to approach things. Now, it is 732, and I said I want to give you time for questions. I would like to get somebody, there's a couple mics up here, can I, Eddie, would you, would you help me with this? I say Eddie because I know Eddie's name. Um, <laughs> Eddie, will you come up here and let me get somebody from, Frank, will you help me on this side? I got two mics and just so people online can hear, if there is a question, we want to make sure that uh, they can hear us. So we got two mics up here. Um, so are there any questions you want to ask me tonight? Now, while we're getting to it, raise your hand if you've got a question that you want to ask or something you might... Right down here. We'll start right here. So we're going to go to her first. But before we go there, let me tell you one thing. Um, There's a few things I wanted to tell you uh, about now. Intersperse these in here. Visiting. I try to make it my point to visit the shut-ins and those in the hospital first. People who are not able to be here, I give them priority when it comes to visiting because they're not able to be here. If you're able to be here week in and week out, out, I'm able to see you here. Uh, Not that I don't want to visit you, but I'm not going to come to your house unless you ask me to come. If you need me as your pastor to come visit you, you want me to come visit you, you let me know and I'll be there. But the people that are here regularly, I'm not going to visit them unless they ask me to come visit. The people who are shut-ins and not able to be here, I'm going to try to spend a lot of time visiting them through the week. So if you ever need me or you just want to sit down and talk, don't hesitate to ask me to come. You just got to let me know you want me there. (laughs) Question one. Um, The last man that was here, um, he went to my doctor's. Appointments, uh-huh. he always stops there. Yeah. So the last Ben that was here went to doctor's appointments. He was really good to you. I really appreciate all that Ben did to take care of you. Now, are you telling me you want me to be at the doctor's appointments too, or are you just telling me that? Uh, I always just have surgery. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll make you a deal. When you have surgery, if you ever have to have surgery, and we'll hope you don't, but if you ever have to have surgery again, you let me know, and I'll do everything I can to be there. Deal? I'll be the new Ben. If it's in Ohio, <laughs> if it's Ohio, we'll Skype. <laughs> Got it. Got it. All right, another question? Now, if y'all don't have questions, I'm going to start my testimony over because we got to go to, we got to go to 745. I wouldn't want to be accused of being a liberal. <laughs> Neither. I actually went to a Christian school in Mount Area. I went to White Plains, uh, White Plains Christian. He asked, did I go to North Surrey or Mount Airy? Surely somebody's got a question. While y'all are thinking of questions, uh, let's talk about my schedule. This is real important. Right now, up until um, June, when Lindsay gets out of school, she's a teacher, when she gets out of school in June, my schedule will change. But for right now, my schedule is I come in, I come to the office most mornings around 11.30, and I'll stay at the office till around 2.30, and then I'll go make visits until I go home in the evening. Um, it won't stay like that. I've got Benson right now. When Lindsay comes home in June, that'll change, and she's cutting back her hours next year so that I will probably start coming in at 8 or 9 and be here till like 12 and then visit in the evenings. If you want to come over here and see me, you are more than welcome to do it, but... But you probably want to call and make sure I'm here because even in those normal business hours, if someone's having surgery, I might be at the hospital. If someone has asked me to come meet them for lunch, I met one of our guys yesterday for lunch. So there's a possibility I might not be here. So if you want to come talk with me here at the office, I'm more than happy to talk with you. But do call just to make sure I'm going to be here because sometimes things come up and I get called out. But right now, I plan to be in the office most days, uh, Mondays. Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I'm in the office, 11.30 to 2.30, 
and unless, unless I have to go out for something. Thursdays, I usually stay at home and study in my home office. I might come to the church here some, though it's been real quiet since I've been here so far. The last church I was at, there was always somebody in and out of the office, and I couldn't get any study done if uh, I stayed at the office, so I would go home and study on Thursdays. That was my plan here, but I think I might mix it up some back and forth just because it seems to be pretty quiet around here right now, and I should be able to get a lot of studying done. So... And uh, I was asked the other day, does that mean an hour for 11.30 to 2.30 and an hour for lunch? No, it doesn't. <laughs> Surely somebody's got a question. Okay, I worked for Mountain Valley Hospice for five years. I started as a... Uh, I went. I thought I was interviewing for a janitor position, and they hired me for something else. So uh, I worked there as a bereavement coordinator. I'm not a licensed counselor, but I was basically a grief counselor, but not a licensed counselor. So I was a bereavement coordinator for adults for the first three years. In the last two years, I worked primarily with children, and uh, and I covered 17 counties. So uh, the hospice in Yak, Mountain Valley Hospice. I know they have an office in Yak, and that's who I worked for. So I've, I've probably come across some of your families or, or you know, people you know uh, during those years. What's your favorite book of the Bible? Oh. <laughs> Whichever one I'm preaching out of right now. <laughs> um, I don't know. I really don't. I, I love Ruth. I like Genesis. Exodus is good. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I really, I really don't have a. I, I don't say that I have a favorite because I, I like all of them. Um, but if I think about it a little bit more, I might can come back with a specific answer to that. What Lori, life verse? my life verse: Galatians two twenty. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So I'm dead, but I'm alive. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. I also like, I think it's Psalm fifteen seventeen, 17, uh, but I shall be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. Yes, ma'am. Did you have any brothers and sisters? Did I have any brothers and sisters? Regrettably, yes. No, I've got, uh, <laughs> I've got an older brother. He is 16 months older than me. Then I've got a younger brother. He actually pastors in Yakinville, so not far from here. And then I've got a younger sister, and she is a, is a nurse in Forsyth County. So there was four of us total. And we got along pretty good. And we still get along pretty good, just as long as we don't talk. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we get along. Me and my family, we all get along great. <laughs> Crown, uh, it's, a little, it's a little independent Baptist uh, college and seminary in Knoxville, Tennessee. Around 1,000 students, I think, when I was there. A favorite parent? Lord, my mama might watch this later, so no, I, <laughs> my mama. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this, I'm like my dad, okay? The older I get, the more I'm like my dad. My dad died a couple years ago, um, but I'm definitely like my dad, uh, but I love my mama too, so no, I don't, I don't have a favorite, and if I did, I couldn't say it online. <laughs> or, anywhere or anywhere else, you're right. Hey, but I've got... My mom and dad, and because she will watch it later, so I want to plug this in there. Uh, I got great parents. My parents have always been good to me. In fact, I remember my dad during all those struggles growing up. He is the only one I ever remember saying to me, Ben, it's just faith. <laughs> He's the only one I remember that ever really tried to plug that in when others were telling me, well, you just need to get, if you're not sure you're saved, you need to get saved. And, you know, they just didn't really know how to deal with it. And, uh, but dad told me it's just faith. And I, I remember sitting on the porch and him telling me that, and that sticks, sticks in my mind. And, you know, I guess I didn't finish that. Uh, you might be wondering, does he know if he's saved now? <laughs> um, it, was, it was in my college years that I really came to really understand that it's faith and faith alone and what that meant. I still believe I became a believer when I was a little boy. I reached out to Christ, I trusted Christ, but it took me years to mature into really understanding that faith and faith in Christ alone was, was all that was necessary on my end. Um, and, and now, you know, when, when struggles come back up in my mind, I just go back to the cross. Christ did it. There's nothing else I can do. So yes, I know I'm saved now. <laughs> that might be important for you to know. <laughs> How 
Well, okay, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'll get to one that's four eventually. Uh, so actually, studies have been done to show that everything in our universe, I'm going to make this sound really complicated when it's not, uh, everything in our universe is, is built on three, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, so there's something in our minds that three is complete. One, that's not, that's not enough. He didn't study. And two, it's just not complete. Three somehow completes in your mind the, the triangle of, of uh, the truth. And then if you go to four, you got to work all the way to six. <laughs> so, so, no, it, honestly, it just, in my mind, it just tends to usually come to three. Um, and every once in a while, there might be four. Sometimes there might be one. But I'll tell you all this. I'll just go ahead and tell you. The times when it's only one, it's going to be longer. I don't know why, but if there's only one point, it's going to be longer. <laughs> Yeah, stick to three. <laughs> we've got about five minutes. Any other questions? I just wanted y'all to have, I, I spent a lot of time with the search team. We've got to know each other a lot. And I wanted y'all just to have a chance to ask questions, get to know each other a little bit as we, we move forward. I'll tell you this. I am easy going. Um, I don't, it's really hard for me to get angry. That's just not something in my wheelhouse. Uh, no, I've got other faults. I promise you, I've got other faults. <laughs> but uh, it's really hard to get me angry or anything like that. Um, I'm pretty easy going, and I want to work with you. You know, I want us to work together for God's kingdom. It's not my way or the highway, but I will tell you this, it is his way or the highway. <laughs> and so when it comes to that, that's the only place where I'm going to, if I feel like God has just really clearly said, this is the way that you need to go, that's the one place I'm going to dig in my heels because I can't disobey him. But other than that, I'll be very easy. I promise you, I'll be very easy to work with because I just want what's best for you and what's best for the church. And I think if, if I want that and if you want that, we can come to a lot of agreement and find a lot, make a lot of ground forward together. Any other questions? Well, I don't know why I had you two come up here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'll send you the check later. <laughs> I will. Last, last call for any questions. All right. Well, any time that you need me, don't hesitate to call me. I mean that. If you need me, don't hesitate to call me. If you're having surgery, I'll be happy to come, pray with you, sit with your family, those sorts of things. Um, but I can if I don't know about it. So if you need me there, you let me know and I'll be there. There's other people who would rather me not come, and that doesn't offend me either. You let me know what you want, and I'll do the best I can to, to make it work. I'm, I'm not going to be offended. So if you want me at, if you're having surgery or you've got something going on, you let me know about it, and I'll do everything I can to be there. And then if you don't want me there, I can pray from home too. <laughs> all right. Well, I look forward to all God's going to do here. And anything that is done here, God's going to have to do it. Um, if we build the house... But we build it, it's just going to fall over. We can, you know, you can grow a church actually pretty easy. You just do a few things and we can have a crowd here next week. But a crowd and a church are not the same thing. And only God can build a church. And that's what I'm asking in the time that he allows me to serve here. That's what I'm asking God to do is build a church. Build a people for himself. A holy people, a people that uh, glories in Christ, that loves the word of God. I just want to see Jesus magnified, and I think you do too. And so I'm looking forward, if we have that mindset together, I'm looking forward to all that, all that God's going to do. And I think it's time for choir practice. Let's take a moment. Let's pray together before we leave tonight. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we have the, our testimony. And, Lord, all of our testimonies are different. All of our struggles have been different. But, Lord, it's the same Savior for all of us. We all needed Christ. And, Lord, I'm thankful that... that He's been provided. Lord, I think about what Spurgeon said. I have a great need for Christ, but I have a great Christ for my need. Lord, we thank you that you're everything we need. And there's nowhere we can go, nothing we can come into that you won't be sufficient. So, Lord, we thank you. Thank you that we can count on you. Lord, I pray in the days to come that you will honor yourself, that you will make much of yourself here, uh, that you will do something here that is so clear that only you did it. Your fingerprints will be all over it and None of us can take the credit, but all we can do is step back and say, God did it, and he gets all the glory. We thank you. Thank you for just the hope we have of the things you're going to do. We love you, and we appreciate the time you've given us together tonight. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen.